Welcome everyone to our afternoon session of our How to Choose. Um, if any questions come up, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll go over them when we have a little break. Um, this is the How to Choose IEPs for Your Self-Assessment. Since you all are part of the 24-25 cohort for our audit process, or monitoring process. So here's our team. Uh, my name is Carly Thibodeau, and I've been on the team for just over two years. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. And with me today is Ashley. Hi, everybody. My name is Ashley Satry, and I recognize some of your names, which feels great. I've been on the team for just over a year now. Um, before I joined the team, I was a special ed teacher as well um, for 14 years, both here and in Virginia. And Julie. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm Julie Pelletier. I'm the admin for the monitoring crew. Um, I'm with DOE for, I'm in my seventh year now. And before that, I was admin support at a K-5 elementary school for 16 years. Awesome. Thank you. And then Colette Sullivan and Jennifer Gleason are other members of our team. They're just busy doing other things right now. <clears throat> so our agenda for today, um, we're just doing what we're called level setting. We're reviewing expectations of the self-assessment. We'll go over other considerations and notes on timelines. And of course, we'll go over any questions that come up or that you have. So again, please feel free to ask those. Here's just a quick visual of um, alignment of the IEP. We will talk about alignment a lot today. So this is just a little visual of how to keep that in mind. Um, you're starting off with those current evaluations and progress results, which feed into the strengths and the gaps for the student, which would then go into the present levels and goals, services, which all feed into that least restrictive environment. And then we have that little snip about the post-secondary transition, because um, if you have a student with a transition plan, that really should be developed first and taken into consideration when developing the rest of the IEP, because that IEP should be supporting that transition plan. So as I was saying, you all are here because you're part of the 24-25 cohort for review. Um, as part of that general supervision system, which we are all members of. And so this is part of IDEA and MUSER. <clears throat> and having said that, monitoring and looking at compliance toward IDEA is one of the main responsibilities of our position in our job, which is looking at all of these pieces. However, we are also responsible for providing professional development or technical assistance um, and just supporting the field. So when we are talking about professional development, we often refer to and we train to best practice. When we are coming on site and looking at files to um, talk about findings for your corrective action plan, we will be looking at compliance. However, when training, we will be training to best practice because really we know that best practice is better programming for all students and it's really what is best for students. So that best practice is really compliance, but just at a higher standard. So an example of this is when you're documenting, um, if a parent chose to waive their right to seven day notice to implement the IEP and it's going to start immediately, Compliance is that you document that in the written notice with a statement, just saying they've waived their seven day notice and the IEP will begin today, tomorrow, whenever it's beginning. However, best practice would be documenting that in the written notice and also using that optional form that's available. And this would cover your bases if you were ever a due process or any ever had any kind of legal situation that you were in. So here is a sample corrective action plan um, that will come at the end of the review process. And you can see on the left-hand side in that red box, we have these finding numbers. These are the codes that we use to keep track of each finding that we look at. 
you do not need to know them or remember them, but we put them out to you so that you know what we're talking about because we do reference them quite a bit. So we put them into our documents just so you have an idea of where they're coming from. So with our team digging into IDEA and really looking at that compliance piece, we have broken up the IEP quick reference document into compliance versus best practice. And we've also changed the format a little bit. So it's on the IEP itself so that each piece and each finding is listed where it would be found within the IEP. So you can see that red is compliance and blue reflects best practice. And the, Ashley, do you know if that link works at the bottom of this one? It does, I just checked it. Oh, okay, great. So that link on this page does work. Our website is under construction. So some of our links are not 100% correct right now. We apologize for that, um, but we'll try to get you the right ones. And if they don't work, please let us know. Okay, so we're going to take a look at those items on the self-assessment. And I think Ashley is gonna take over right now. Yep, um, yeah. I just dropped the links to the PowerPoint again in the chat, but if you come in after, you might not have access, so please just let us know and we can drop it in there again. Um, Okay, so we're just going to go over each of the findings um, that will be looked at in the self-assessment, and I'm going to go a little bit quickly because when we did this this morning, it went over time, and so please just stop me if you have any questions. Um, so we're going to start with FOT7. This is in section one, and this is that the IEP is sent to parents within 21 days of the annual meeting, and what we look for here is the date of the annual meeting, and then we look at at the date sent to parent and make sure that that's within 21 school days and not um, blank. Sometimes we see that blank. So um, FOT8, that's section one again, that's the next annual meeting held within 364 days of the annual meeting. And same thing here, this is where we look for that. We look for the date on the annual, uh, we look for the annual date of the IEP meeting and then the de date of the next IEP meeting to make sure that that's within that 364 days. Uh, CIM1, that's section three, and this is considerations of special factors. That's that section three, which um, if you remember from previous monitoring cycles, we would often look at this and actually the other previous two findings too and give you what was called an isolated deficiency if something wasn't filled out right here. Um, so this is just making sure that it's filled out and that if it is uh, answered as yes, that that consideration is addressed within the IEP with, uh, with goals, services, accommodations, something, just making sure that it is represented in the IEP. All right, and then RAE1, this is section 4A. This will probably be familiar to you guys. This is the results of the initial or most recent evaluations of the student. And... 4A, what we like to see here is that the academic and functional or developmental evaluations were used in eligibility decisions, any relevant state or district assess assessments, uh, transition assessments, um, any other assessments that are um, relevant for the student, like an FBA or related services, et cetera. Um, and any evaluations that go beyond that three years um, must be agreed upon by the SAU and the parent, and that would just be documented in the written notice. So if you weren't going to reevaluate um, a certain assessment beyond that three years and you agree upon that, we would just then look in your written notice to make sure that that discussion was had. Um, when documenting, we do not have a specific format that we're looking for, but we are looking for that evaluation name, the date of the evaluation, and of course the scores. Um, a little comment in our, our bubble over here. Um, sometimes when a disability category is identified very young and uh, we're looking at a student who's further along in 11th grade or so say, and they were identified with um, the example of autism in first grade, you would not always see that reevaluation for that autism. Um, so just make sure that that's pulled forward 
um, the, we recommend just the date and the name of the evaluation and, and something to make that reference of that autism. Um, you don't need to put all of the scores, you don't need to put all of the sub scores there, but just something to make sure that that's still represented on this, on the section 4A. Um, AFS 1, this is that section 4B, that's the academic, functional, and or developmental strengths of the student. And here's what we look for there. So um, one of the findings we generally see here is that sometimes it's left blank. So making sure that there are some strengths for the student and those academic strengths and areas we would be looking for reading, writing, listening, speaking, and math problem solving. And then for the functional and developmental side of things, we'd be looking for that cognitive, communicative, motor, adaptive, social, emotional, and sensory. Um, just making sure that there are some strengths listed there. These are based on the evaluations and observations of the students, um, but not a restatement of those evaluations, like the, the, the scores and stuff. Um, what does that look like in the classroom? Um, not a restatement of the standard scores again, and this should be observable. What does this strength look like in the classroom? I like to think of this as an area that is not necessarily data-driven like every other thing on the IEP. What does the student enjoy doing? What are they good at doing? What do they think they're good at doing? Um, this is a great opportunity to kind of talk about those strengths of the child. Um, are they friendly? Are they a good, good um, listener, et cetera? Um, all right, APG2, this is a two-parter of section 4C on the IEP. So the first part is the academic gaps or skill deficits. And then the second part is the how statement about those skill deficits. So when you're looking at section 4C on the IEP, just remember, we need to see both of these things. So we want to see the identification of those distinctly measurable and persistent gaps in the academic performance and the how statement for how the deficit has an adverse impact on the child accessing the gen ed curriculum. And we do recommend listing those gaps in a bulleted list just for ease of alignment, um, just makes it clear what the gaps would be. Um, and we'll talk about the alignment piece, but it does not have to be. We just recommend that. Um, so the distinctly measurable and persistent skill, that skill gap, how do those deficits impede the child's ability to complete a task across content areas within the gen ed curriculum? And an example here for Jane is that Jane would have a comprehension deficit. So that would be one of those bulleted skill gaps. And for her how statement, this is just an example too. It does not have to be this way, but we like to give this example of Jane has limited reading comprehension skills, which impact her ability to comprehend grade level text and accurately provide details describing in text across content areas within the gen ed curriculum. So just most importantly there, remember that you have to have the gap and the how statement. And uh, you do not have to have one how statement for each gap, you can, uh, group them together as long as that makes sense. If they have multiple um, skill deficits in reading, if they struggle with fluency and comprehension, um, you can always do one encompassing how statement for those just as long as everything's represented with the how statement. Okay, and here's that alignment. So APG6, that is section 4C, that's those academic gaps that you put there being aligned to goals. So every academic skill, skill gap that is listed in 4C should have a goal representing it. So you can just see those one-to-one -one correspondence there. And here's another example. Um, this student in 4C has um, skill gaps in addition with regrouping and single digit subtraction. You can see the how statements there too. The students' gaps in math computation affect their involvement in the gen ed curriculum. But then you can see that alignment. So you have a goal for addition with regrouping, and then you have another goal for single digit subtraction. So one-to-one -one correspondence there with those gaps to goals. 
And then this is going to sound very familiar because it's much of the same information just on the functional and developmental side. So looking at section 4D and functional goals. Uh, so FDP2 and FDP7, that's those two parters, the gaps, and then the functional and developmental how statement. And this again is in section 4D. So the same thing here, you're going to want your functional uh, distinctly measurable and persistent skill gaps in functional performance, as well as your how statement on how those deficits have an adverse impact on the child accessing the gen ed curriculum. Um, same slide here, just around how that affects their um, completing a task across content areas in the gen ed curriculum for functional for Ben, he has a gap in regulation. Um, and Ben's limited self-regulation deficits impact his ability to comprehend and apply social rules and generalize those rules to other situations, which impacts his ability to engage with peers with the gen ed, within the gen ed setting. And again, that's uh, not the only way that can be done, but that's one example. Um, and then alignment again for functional um, FDG1, that's aligning those gaps in section 4D to the goals in section 5. And here's that visual again of just whatever you represent as a skill gap or skill deficit in 4D, make sure that there's a goal to address that. All right, and then here is another example of what that alignment looks like. Um, in this section 4D, this student has two skill gaps, one for following a visual schedule, one for requesting help, um, you can see their how statement is that these gaps affect Sammy's ability to access age-appropriate classroom activities. And then you can see that alignment there. So you have a goal for following a visual schedule, and you have a goal for, this is where the font gets just a little bit small for my eyes, sorry guys, uh, for accessing the help. So just that alignment piece, you'll see here I say alignment so many times. Um, this is just a visual of that alignment. So you can see that you're starting with that disability identification and evaluations. Those will lead you to your academic and functional skill gaps, which will then lead you to the present level of performance in those areas, which will then lead to your goals. So one-to-one -one correspondence of all, the, all that stuff for each gap, you're looking for that measurable goal that goes with it. Um, any questions about that? And sorry, I was going a little bit fast there. I will slow down. Um, Carly, did you see anything in the chat there? Yeah, there was, a, it's a statement, um, just that CDS IEPs to parent, the kids aren't in school. Um, yes, however, in Muser, it does outline that, and I don't know how to distinguish this between CDS and school age, but it does say for ages three to 22 that the IEP needs to be sent to parents within 21 school days. So we can talk about that as far as the CDS piece because we had that similar question this morning because I believe maybe CDS has been told 21 calendar days, um, but compliance would be 21 school days. So we can talk more about that if we need to. Um, Carly, I will let you go on after this question if you're ready for that, after this sure. question answer section. All right. Yeah. All right, next is SBG3. This is about the academic goals being measured. So having measurable acad academic goals Compliance for that is that they must be measurable and include measurement data of some type, and they cannot be a specific curriculum or standard score. Um, best practice would be to include one specific skill rather than multiple, and it really should be skill specific versus that outcome based goal, which we'll talk a little bit about. And then, really using um, that specific skill to measure that goal versus just a, a grade level grade or something like that. Um, so here's an example of not using that specific curriculum. 
So let's say you're using a program where the student moves from level three to level four, and they need to be able to meet these things in fluency and reading comprehension to get from level three to level four. So instead of saying that the student will move from a level to a level, you should pick out that specific skill within that program that you're using or that curriculum that you're using. You can still use your programs, you can still use your curriculums. However, think about which skills within that curriculum or program that they're really working on or need to work on because maybe they're already really good at reading comprehension, but they really need to work on fluency or vice versa. So it's best to include one skill within your goal to be able to progress monitor that and get the best measurement data on that skill. And um, yeah, and so focus on that one skill. Sorry, I'm a little, it's the afternoon. I hope all of you can feel that too, because I don't, I don't know. I feel like I did this way better in the morning. <laughs> Just putting that out there. Um, SVG4 is about the academic goals being cited to a standard. So compliance for this is that each academic goal has a citation that links it to a standard, whether it be the main learning results, the common core, or your district adopted standards. Best practice is that that citation is cited to the grade level standard that the student is in. And then for the students that are taking the alternate academic achievement standards that the you would be using that grade level of that student to cite those alternate academic achievement standards for those students taking the alternate assessment. And then we just have some links to the alternate assessment information below. And here's just an example of how a citation may look when you're citing to the main learning results. We had this question come up a while back and we know that the common core is easier to cite to, so we don't get as many questions about that, but the main learning results we do. So this is just one example. Um, you can put it at the end, you can put it at the beginning, you can put it in the middle, as long as the citation is somewhere with the goal, we will find it. SVG5 is about alignment again, and this is the alignment from the academic goal to a service on the service grid because if you have a goal, it needs to have a service. So here's an example. This IEP has three goals, which are all focused around writing. And so when we see that, we would then flip to the service grid and make sure that there is a service on the service grid that outlines that they are receiving specially designed instruction for writing, because all of these say given specially designed instruction. So we would expect to see that with that writing there. Now, these are going to sound very familiar because we're going to talk about functional. We just went through the pieces for academic. Now this is functional goals being measurable. So it's the same compliance piece. Each functional goal needs to be measurable and have that measurement data within it. And it cannot be a specific curriculum or use those standard scores. Best practice is that the functional goals, just like the academic goals, focus on a specific skill versus that outcome. So you can see here in this example, or maybe you can't because it's pretty small print, but this goal is around given specially designed instruction and consult from an occupational therapist. This student is going to improve their self-regulation skills as demonstrated by independently utilizing a tool from their individual toolkit, including a bunch of things, and this will help them self-regulate. Now, it says in the bottom, increase time wearing a mask. So this is from back in the days of COVID when people were still wearing masks in school. And so the outcome of this was that the student wasn't wearing a mask. So what can we teach them to help them increase their time wearing a mask? And so the team decided that they would um, teach them this self-regulation skill and give them this toolkit where they could utilize some tools to help them do that. So the outcome would be that they want them to increase that time wearing a mask, but 
the goal is really focused on teaching them the skills to be able to do that and reach that outcome. FDP six is another alignment one. This time we're looking at the functional goals being aligned to a service on the service grid because every goal needs a service. So here we have two functional goals and it says given specially designed instruction in the first one. And then the second one is given specially designed instruction and BCBA consultation. So these functional goals are both around executive, as executive functioning skills. So that's why the SDI on the service grid is labeled with executive function. And then the BCBA consultation also aligns because that second goal is about SDI and BCBA consultation. Both of those services or those positions responsible will be working together on that one goal. All right, any questions so far? I haven't seen anything come up in chat, but please feel free. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. Feel free to drop things as they come up. SAS1 is the section six of the IEP where you list those accommodations, modifications, supplementary aids and services. <clears throat> so here, when you're filling this out, you just want to remember that if you put something in the left-hand column, then you need to fill out the entire row. Remember to check off those boxes of where the student will be accessing that accommodation or modification, fill in that location, the frequency, and the duration. It's also noted here that if you have a collaboration between staff members, you can put that here in section six. Oftentimes we see this, um, under section seven as a consult, but there's no goal aligned to it. So if you put consult on the service grid and, you're, and we say, where's your goal for consult? And you're like, oh, we're not working on a goal. We're just checking in with each other to make sure the, the student is doing okay. Then you would not put that on the service grid. You would document that in section six as an accommodation. And instead of calling it consultation, just so there isn't confusion, our recommendation is to call it collaboration under other. And we'll kind of talk about this when we get to section seven also. Alt one is 6B, where you're checking off yes, no, or NA, which best practice would be to check one of those boxes. However, compliance is that if you check yes, the student is going to take the alternate assessment, there must be an explanation. Then if you do check yes, for a student needs to take the alternate assessment, that leads us to Alt 2 because that student's IEP, their academic goals need to have objectives. So this student was identified as needing to take the alternate assessment. Excuse me, they have an academic goal, so they must have objectives. And you can see here, there are two objectives and they're just, they're the same as the goal. They're just broken down into smaller chunks throughout the year. <clears throat> SVC2 is about section seven being completed, that service grid. And just a reminder that the child's needs drive the services and the frequency of those services, not the school or program schedule. Um, we see this more like in the middle school, high school, where there may be block scheduling. And so if a student doesn't need that entire block for services, it really shouldn't be listed on the IEP as being that entire block. So just keep that in mind. If they only need 30 minutes, but the block is 90, then the service grid shouldn't say 90. It really should reflect that 30 that the student needs. So just keep that in mind. We know this is a tricky point with, with that scheduling piece. 
Um, when you're filling out the service grid, just like the accommodation section, if you put something in the left-hand side as either a special ed service or a related service, you want to fill out across the row. So when you're put putting the position responsible, this needs to be the special, I mean, the certified special ed teacher or the licensed related service provider. If you have ed techs or any kind of assistance working with the student, you do not list them here. Do not put them in section seven. If you would like to acknowledge that an ed tech is working with a student or a CODA or an SLPA, those can be also listed in section six under the accommodations so that it's noted that those staff are working. But the position responsible is that certified person. Um, then must fill that location, special ed, gen ed, or both. Then you've got your frequency, which can be documented. However, it makes sense for all of you and the IE, all the members of the IEP team understand. That's all that matters. And then your duration dates, whatever the duration dates are of that service. And then just remembering to adjust to those ESY dates for the time that ESY is happening. Because if you go for the duration of the IEP, you could be asked to provide services during other breaks, like February break or April break, things like that. So remember to adjust those dates. And then just a note about speech and language, because sometimes we will see speech and language under related when it should be up above in special ed services. The time when speech and language should be listed under special ed service versus the related service is if the child is identified as a student with a speech and language impairment, either by itself or part of a multiple, or if the child is identified with autism and speech and language is the only service that they get. That's when it would be a direct. And then here is that same information I gave about um, the consultation. If you are putting consultation on your service grid, it should be written into a goal, given consultation or given OT consultation or whatever kind it is. If it is not in a goal, then it probably should be listed as an accommodation in section six under that collaboration, like, uh, which is what I talked about before. <clears throat> SVC4, this is a new one, and we had many questions about this this morning, so we'll do our best to answer them, but they were all great questions. This is about Section 7 and provider schedules. So we need to make sure that the IEP services are being, um, are, are being done by providers. So the best way that we thought that we could look at that is when we come on site, we will look at the service grid on the student's IEP and then ask for the provider schedule to see if that service for that student is on the schedule with someone. So for example, this says specially designed reading instruction, I mean, specially designed instruction for reading fluency. So, oh, okay, I'm going to say something about that after but anyway for reading fluency and the so then we would expect to see a schedule from a provider that has this student in a group for reading fluency at some at some time um yeah and disregard our example there because we have an ed tech listed as the position responsible i don't know why we have that screenshot do you see that my I team i do see that That's yeah i'm like what in the world are we doing okay <laughs> Don't look at the rest of that. Oh my gosh. Uh, can services overlap? Social skills taught within a literacy lesson. Yes, that would be appropriate. Yeah. Because, and we give that guidance about documenting on the service grid. Like if you're doing ELA, you can put ELA slash behavior because we know it's not always in isolation. So it can be together for sure. LRE1 is about the least restrictive environment statement on the IEP. 
this is the prompt on the IEP, but this is not what we look for for compliance. So the IEP committee is working on updating the IEP, and this is one of the things that they're working on changing so that it reflects what we're looking for for compliance. Because <clears throat> what we look for, and this comes from IDEA and the user, we're looking for a statement about why the student with the disability is being removed from the gen ed setting due to the nature and severity of their disability, why they can't be with their non-disabled peers. Then we're also looking at that percentage being filled in for the least restrictive environment. So here we have an example. You can see that percentage is filled in. So that's what you need to do for compliance. And then your statement for the least restrictive environment can be as simple as Sammy's other health impairment due to ADHD is to such a degree that he requires individual and small group instruction in the special education environment. That is an example of a compliant LRE statement. Any questions about those pieces or any other pieces? <clears throat> okay, we're gonna keep going. So we do have a full IEP training scheduled for Tuesday, October 15th from nine to 11.30. If you have more questions about IEP stuff. Um, okay, so now we're going, to, we're going to go through the parts or the pieces that we look at for the transition plans. <clears throat> In the transition plans, this is what we call B13. We reference that quite a bit because this is one of those federal indicators where we need to report to OSEP, the Office of Special Ed Programming. And it's, it's an all or nothing, which is frustrating for us and for all of you, because we look at these different components. And if even one component is non-compliant, the entire transition plan is considered non-compliant. So in the expectation from OSEP is that it's 100% 100% of the time. So <clears throat> one of the pieces that we look at would be on the advanced written notice for those students with transition plans that the purpose of the meeting is checked off, that those post-secondary goals and transition services will be discussed. So typically this is with the annual review. That, that would be the one that we look at to make sure that that is checked off. Um, because we're, we're looking at that annual review IEP, typically. TRA2, we also look at the advanced written notice for this finding, and this is to make sure that the child was invited to attend the meeting. So compliance is that they are listed as a participant or an invitee to the meeting on the advanced written notice on that second page, but best practice would be to include them in the salutation. I know that sometimes this is a vendor issue. It will list the parents, but you don't have the option to add the student and that's okay as long as they're on the second page as being invited. <clears throat> TRA3 is about outside agencies being invited. So we look at 9G on the transition plan, advanced written notice, and parental consent if we need to. So we look at 9G, and if you have someone listed as an agency responsible to provide and or pay for services in 9G, then we would look for the consent to invite the outside agency or the parental consent to invite the outside agency because when we started looking into IDEA and really looking at the compliance, we found that IDEA states that the public agency must invite that representative of that outside agency that's likely to be responsible for providing and paying for transition services. So you all are the public agency. Before we gave guidance that the parent could invite them and you just had to document that. However, 
like I said, after we dug into compliance with the regulations and things, we found that it is a, the public agency must invite them. So to document that, you'll use this parental consent to invite and you'll want to send this to the parent to get consent before you send out the advanced written notice. Anytime you check post-secondary on the advanced written notice. So your documentation will be putting the data that you gave this or mailed it to the parent. And if they don't give you consent, then that's your documentation that you tried, but they didn't give consent. But if they sign it, send it back, keep that signed version because that's your documentation that you got consent. And then they need to be invited on the advanced written notice, that outside agency. TRA-4 is about documenting in the written notice that the transition planning goals have been updated annually. So you can just check off that post-secondary goals and transition services on the written notice and then make a statement within the written notice somewhere. This is in section number five, but you can put it anywhere. It doesn't matter. We'll find it um, and just make a statement. I think I see them mostly in section one, actually because it's part of the determinations usually, um, where they say that the team reviewed and updated the transition plans and transition goals. TRA-5 is 9B of the transition plan where you list those transition assessments. So make sure to document all the transition assessments that have been completed for the student. Um, and best practice is to include the year that the assessment was done, but that's just best practice. Compliance is having at least one transition assessment in there. And there's a link here that will take you to transition assessment resources. There are many on the website, the transition main website. It's a great resource. TRE 6A is about the post-secondary goals for education and training. So just making sure that there's a goal there. When you're thinking about putting in, for this example, it says attend a four-year college or university. Don't specifically put, like, we'll go to CMCC or KVCC or something like that, because there's no guarantee that that student's going to go there. So it's best to keep this vague, like that four-year college or university or something like that. So it's whatever they plan on doing. 6B is about the post-secondary goal for employment. So again, this should um, relate to or be in alignment to that education and training that they have. So the bill wants to go to school to, for marketing or become a carpenter. So his employment is around getting a job in, with marketing or as a carpenter. <clears throat> Six, TRA 6C is about the independent living goal. And this is when appropriate. So this won't always be appropriate for a student, but if it is, just consider it even though um, for all children. TRA 7 is 9E on the transition plan, and this is the courses of study for the student. So when you're listing the courses of study, you want to include their current year of high school to their anticipated exit. And it's best to, kept, to keep previous years in there. So for this student that, play, that is supposed to graduate in 2026, they have their courses of study starting in 2022 when they became a freshman and all the way through their senior year. If they are going to be there longer than the four years, you would include those years, start thinking about that as soon as you can for that student. Um, and if you are listing courses here, be thinking about the courses that are available that would align to those goals. Like you can see carpentry one and two, and then the intro to marketing, that sort of thing. Um, and again, these will change because the transition plan is all about showing that growth for that student. So this may be what it looks like right now, but it could change at the next annual meeting when the plan is updated. TRA-8 is that 
9F, where you list the transition services. So when you're listing transition services and activities, these should not include future services or activities. You want to do the ones that they have done previously. You can keep those on there and add to them the ones that they're currently doing, but it should not be future ones. Um, you should have at least one for each service. So there shouldn't be any box that says NA. Obviously the daily living skills at the bottom says if appropriate. So that one could be blank. Um, it's best to document this in a bulleted list. <clears throat> and TRA 9 is about the alignment of the annual goals in section five of the IEP to the post-secondary goals on the transition plan. So there needs to be at least one annual, one goal on the IEP that aligns to those post-secondary. So basically it could be any goal on the IEP really, if you think about it, because it's needed for them to get to their post-secondary. So this is just an example. This is about Bill working on managing his anxiety, which would be necessary to meet any of his post-secondary goals, because that is all encompassing. <clears throat> okay, I see another question has come up in chat. Do we need to obtain parental consent to invite community-based case managers when we are discussing post-secondary goals and transition services? I don't think so. Community-based case managers, they are not an outside agency paying for services, I do not believe. So you do not need consent to invite. It's only for those agencies, whatever that prompt says, likely to, um, what does it say? Let me go back to it, hold on. Right here. Representative participating agency are likely to be responsible for providing or paying for transition services. So it's about those transition services. And I do not think those community-based case managers are providing or paying for transition services. So as long as they are not, then you do not need parental consent. All right, and then we do have the B13 trainings coming up in October and then another in May. Um, and again, B13 is transition. So that will go into the transition plans in depth. Any other questions? We are um, putting together a list, and this is a very lengthy list, but we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible so that you have everything ready when we come for our on-site visit, so that when we get there, we're not like, oh, by the way, we need this, and then you're running around trying to get it for us, because that has happened in the past. So we're trying to be proactive and put together our list as things come up. Um, but this is what we will be looking at when we come on site and the evidence that we will need to see. And it looks like a lot because we used to ask for several of these as part of our desk audit that we would ask you to submit to us ahead of time. But we've taken that, we've gotten rid of the desk audit because of feedback that it was very overwhelming to get all of those pieces <clears throat> and send it to us ahead of time. So now we're just doing it when we go on site. So if you have any questions about anything on this list, you can reach out to us and we'll be happy to go into more detail about what it is or what you need to gather. All right, I see another question came in. Do we need to cite the standard as the student's grade level standard if they are performing well below grade level, i.e. in third grade, but working on K standard? Best practice is to use the grade level standard that best aligns to the goal that the student is working on. So if the student is a third grader working on a kindergarten standard or kindergarten skill. There may be a third grade standard that it could align to, 
I don't know for sure. I mean, you'd have to look at your standards, but <clears throat> it's best practice to align it to the grade level the student is in versus. Yes. Yes. Align it. Best practice to the grade level they're in. I'm just going to leave it at that. When we come on site, we will be looking at out of unit placements that have been students that have been placed in an out of unit placement within the past two years. So these are the components that we'll look at. Um, you can see we will be looking at written notices and advanced written notices for the majority of this. And then also the IEP to make sure that it was sent within those 21 school days. So having those, these documents available is very helpful when we come on site. <clears throat> these are the forms and eligibility forms that we will be looking at. And so you can see this just goes through um, what each of those forms and eligibility forms should include and have documented on them. The links next to them where it says quick reference checklist will take you to each of these forms and outline what is compliance and best practice, very similar to what our IEP quick reference document is like. If you want to do some more training or get some more information about eligibility or um, using those eligibility forms, this link will take you to a training that we have recorded. We'll also be looking at B11. This is another federal indicator around child find that we also have to um, report to the Office of Special Ed Programming. So we look at INR3. That's the B11 piece, that 45 school day timeline. The evaluations are being, initial evaluations are being completed within the 45 school days. So we do ask to look at 10 initial evaluations completed. And then we also look to make sure that you're documenting that procedural safeguards were offered or given to the parent upon that initial referral. So if you're documenting it at the eligibility meeting, that's too late. Make sure you're documenting that you're offering the procedural safeguards at the initial referral, either through the advanced written notice, the written notice, or even that consent to evaluate form in some way. We are also looking at B12, which is another federal indicator. And this is for, I lost the word this morning, but I think I have it, early adopters. If any of you are early adopters for those three, four, three-year-olds, yep, from part C to part B, then we'll be looking at that transition from part C to part B. And we'll be looking to see that the IEP was implemented before the child's third birthday or start of the school year if it was a summer birthday. Yeah. Okay. We also look at any students on abbreviated day. And an abbreviated day is any day that a child with a disability goes to school for less time than their non-disabled peers. So we look at any of those files. If you say we have no students on abbreviated day, we're like, great, and we move on. But if you have people on students on abbreviated day, we do look at their files. And it really is best if we can look at the whole file just because we kind of have to dig through and find these pieces that we're looking for. There are two reasons students can be on abbreviated day, educational and medical. These are the components we're looking for when we are looking for documentation of those students that are on educational abbreviated day. So you can see there are quite a few and we find those in various places like the written notice throughout parts of the IEP, even the advanced written notice. So it's easiest for us if we can have that whole file to look through those written notices and IEPs and things. Medical is the other reason for abbreviated day and medical is a little less doesn't require as much documentation, but these again are the components that we will be looking for 
that are documented within the written notice, the IEP advanced written notice. So please take a look at these, make sure these are in the student files for us to look at. And if you have questions about how to document students on abbreviated day, this is a link to our professional development on that topic. It's specific to abbreviated day and it goes through what should be documented in the written notice, especially, and how the IEP should be updated. Any questions so far? All right, I don't see anything in the chat, so we will keep going. Timelines. So we did a cohort training, I think it was in May. We asked that all B13 screeners, those transition plans, just section nine, were submitted to us. We just asked for two <clears throat> by June 30th. And then we have two ways you can submit evidence to us. We have our secure monitoring.doe at main.gov email, or you can send it through the regular mail to Julie and the address is there. And if you are on our list for visits for November and December, we ask that you complete your self-assessment by October 1st. And if you are on our list for visits in April and May, we ask that your self-assessment is completed by March 1st. And that link for the self-assessment is specific to your SAU and it was sent in the June email. If you do not have it, please reach out to us because we can get it out to you. Everything else will be looked at when we come on site. That's why the on-site list is quite lengthy. Just some other notes about timelines. After our visit, typically the Friday after, as long as we can get it done, um, we will send out pre-findings. You'll have a, one month to submit evidence of correction of pre-findings. Pre-findings are optional. And pre-findings are um, sent out if you have them, they're an they are not an indication of systemic non-compliance. I don't that, that sounds like a double negative to me. That tr trips me up every time I try to talk about it. So anyway, most people will have pre-findings, but it isn't a guarantee. You may not, but if you do, it's optional to correct them. If you correct them, then those findings will not be on your cat, which is why we offer them. Um, also, we will send out any findings for those students on abbreviated day, and those are required to be corrected within the month. Um, that is not optional, and those will be considered corrected for the child specific, but then on your cap, you will have a finding for systemic correction, which here it says prong two, but we've changed our wording, systemic correction. So we'll ask for systemic correction, but the child specific will have been completed within that, those 30 days. <clears throat> okay, so then if you're in November, December visit, your CAP or your corrective action plan will be issued. We'll send out an email with all your CAP stuff and Julie will put it in the mail that day as a hard copy. And we'll send those out on January 31st of 2025. And then your CAP will be due November 30th of 2025. So all of the evidence to complete those findings will be due by then. If you're an April, May visit, then your CAP will be issued by email and hard copies put in the mail on June 30th of 2025. And then your CAP evidence and everything required to be closed will be due by April 30th of 2026. Uh, which just cracks me up that we're already talking about 2026. <clears throat> okay, and then that CAP evidence submission. So when you're sending evidence to close that CAP, once you've been issued the CAP, you have, you're have you going to have those two types of evidence, the child-specific and the systemic. So the child-specific, we will send you um, those students 
files that we looked at and found non-compliance, we'll send you a list. It's, I think we're changing the name of it. Right now we call it findings by student. So we'll tell you each student and the finding that they have, and you'll need to complete, correct each instance of non-compliance. Before we just used to ask for a subset, but guidance from OSEP, which we call 2301 came out and they require that we see correction of each instance of non-compliance. Systemic correction is evidence outside of those students on that list. So it would be anybody not on that list. You could send us files from them to show us correction of that, that it's subsequent going forward. Okay, so now we get to do, oh, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. Oh, yes, I do, okay. Wait a minute, no, I don't. I have to take a minute and think. Why don't you want me to um, bring it up? Because I'm here and- Oh, I you're have... here. Oh, fantastic. Sure. Yeah, just swoop in for the last moment, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> just out eating your bonbons and whatnot. Yeah. Okay, stop sharing. That's what I've been doing. Okay. Um, share. All right, can you see that? Is it the right screen? Oh, cool. Yeah, good. Yes, it is. Sorry, okay. I'm all right. <laughs> okay, so you should all have a link to your specific self assessment form. If you do not have your link, um, let your whoever your contact person is here on the monitoring team know and they can get you your link. But it went out with the June email that had all of this information in it. So easy peasy. Um, for those of you that were in cohort four years ago and had to do the self-assessment on that horrible big spreadsheet, hopefully this is much better. So I'm just going to just type garbage in here, but um, first name, last name, date of birth, you can click on the little, you know, little thing here, little calendar and put a date in, or you can just type it in. If you type it in, um, it has to be in this format or else you'll get an error message. Um, student age, date of the last annual. So this is the IP that you're reviewing, the date that that was created. If your student attends any school outside of your district, so this can be an SPPS, a regional po program. If you don't have a high school and you tuition to another district, um, 60, 40 schools, any of that kind of stuff, put that in here. Uh, multilingual learner, yes or no, your case manager. And then here you have all of the identifications. So you just click which one. If you click multiple, it will bring up a box and ask you to put in which disabilities are contributing to that multiple. And then you just go down and answer the questions and it tells you exactly what you're looking for. So you don't really need to know the code, but this is the code. Section one means section one of the IEP. So this is just, is the next annual date within 364 days of the last annual date, yes or no? I mean, was it sent to the parent within 21 school days? If you select no on anything, it's gonna ask you why. So you just put greater than 21 school days, whatever you wanna put in there. Um, so you could see CIM1 is section three. It'll always tell you what section of the IEP you're in and you have definitions for yes and no. So is each question answered? So we're making sure in section three that there is yes or no is checked for everything. And for everything that's checked yes, is that addressed somewhere in the IEP, right? So if you have behavior checked, is there something in the IEP addressing behavior? It can be just accommodations, that's fine, but there has to be something in there. So it just goes through every single thing we look at and it's just a yes or no. At the end, it will have a question that says, is this child 16 years or older? 
And if you say yes, it'll bring you into the transition plan questions. Um, that is, we only look at 16 or older because it's a federal indicator and that's the federal requirements. Um, that's what we re have to report to OSEP is 16 and older. So that's all we look at for a transition plan. And that's it for that. All right, am I back up? Okay. Yeah. okay. Just one second. Sandy, um, there is a practice one that um, we can send you the link for the practice one if anybody wants to practice. Um, and you can just put whatever in there and it won't go anywhere. But if you use your specific link for your SAU, it is going to go into that spreadsheet. And you can share... Um, you can share your link with anybody that's helping you. You know, if you have teachers or IEP coordinators doing the self-assessment, share the link with whoever you want to share and it'll all feed into the same place. I will put that link in the chat for the um for the practice one. All right, all set. Sorry, Carly. No, you're good. I think I think Ashley dropped it in the chat already. So that's great. Oh, Ashley, you're the best. Yeah, I just yeah. linked our whole page. It's the first link on the page. But um, when I link only the link, I'd like to be able to go back and see where it came from. So hopefully that link will <laughs> <after you guys. laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Um, there's another question on there. Who receives this? So the spreadsheet goes to us. Um, and once we um, do our magic with that, um, we will send you, whoever your person is, will send you um, kind of a summary of what you put in it. It will have all of your students and any of the um, indicators that you said no to and why you said no. So it will bring, it will give you a summary of what you put in. I know, and, and can they, when they fill out their own, can't they do something at the end where they get a list? Yes, you can. It's not. It's not a list, though. It's not oh, as okay. what we send. Oh, okay, okay. It, you can save it, but it saves it just like in that form format, so you oh. don't. Yeah, you don't get like a spreadsheet. You just get like that, that one. You could save it at the end, but what, oh. once it's done and we we download it into the into our spreadsheet, we will send you a summary. Mm -hmm. We have gotten some feedback um, that as you're putting them into the self-assessment, you might wanna just keep a list for yourself because there's no way, I think, unless Jennifer fixed it, to just go back and see if you've put some in or all in. So just keep a list for yourself as you're putting them in. Um, we can pull that information for you too, but um, we just got a little feedback about and that. If you, if you put one in and then say, oh no, I didn't mean to do that, let us know and we can pull that student right off of the file too. And don't mm -hmm. don't worry about any mistakes you make because everything is fixable. Absolutely. All right, we're wrapping things up. So resources. We have the procedural manual. These links do work in the PowerPoint if you have them up on your computer. So this will take you to the procedural manual, great resource. Maine Unified Special Ed Regulations or MUSER. This is the updated version from July of 2024 with that age to 22 and some other disability uh, category changes, names. Um, the 24-25 IEP quick reference document but I think this is the link that does not work. Is that right, Ashley? Yes, that's correct. The yeah. This link does not work, but the one earlier in the presentation does work. Yes, because as we said, our website has been under construction. So because of that, some things aren't quite right. Um, yeah, so we already talked about this, but this is another resource. We have our professional development calendar where you can see our upcoming PD and sign up for that. Uh, we have links to recordings and PowerPoints because everything we do, we record and put.
put up the accompanying PowerPoint on the website for you to access at a later time than all of those other resources here. This is our 24-25 schedule for professional development for this school year. Um, Colette did the first one, the first office hours last Wednesday around resources. And so now we're moving on and we have quite a few. And these Carly, links will take you to the registration. Yeah. And Carly, we've made one change to the schedule. Um, I, I forgot to mention it this morning, but um, the one on 423, that's actually being moved to 528 because 423 is in the middle of April vacation. So yes. um, I am sharing the link, the new revised schedule. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. And I did actually update it on here so you can see there's no 423 here oh, and it's 528 because there's two pages. I have two pages. One okay. from September to December and then January to May. But yes, that I did remember to update it for this. Yep. And okay, and then this is our feedback and contact our form. So if you follow this link or the QR code, it'll take you to our feedback form. We appreciate any feedback you give us. We try to accommodate and adjust our professional development when considering that feedback as much as we can. And if you put your email in, we will send you a contact hour certificate for today along with copies of this PowerPoint so you can access a, access them and the links within if as long as they're working. Um, so yeah. Uh, oh, when you select the training, it'll say select the training you attended. This is the how to choose training. So that's the one you can pick. DOE on social media. This is all of our DOE stuff. You can find us here. And then our contact information. So we are here to support you. So please feel free to reach out with us, reach out to us with questions or if you need feedback with something. Um, just make sure if you are talking about a specific student and it's an IEP or forms or anything like that, just don't put it in the actual IEP and send it to us or the form. Pull it out, take out the student name, and we are happy to answer questions or provide feedback. Uh, team, is there anything else that you would like to share that I did not? I don't think so. Okay, that's great. So we really appreciate all of you joining us this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing so I can, I always have a hard time getting myself out of here. Okay. All right, so I think we are all set. Have a great evening.